Our next speaker is Mike Hodnick, and he's a programmer from Minnesota, and he's released many a Title Cycles record. And he is one of the major reasons I started coding in Title Cycles, and his sound has evolved uh, in towards the hardware direction recently. And his setup is is very intriguing because it's hard to tell what's what's going on when there's hardware and you see the code, but you don't know what's going on inside of the synthesizers and the drum machines. And it's harder to see how they're interfaced. So Mike's gonna present about his, his workflow for controlling his instruments with title cycles. Take it away, Mike. Thank you. I've got this well rehearsed now, so here we go. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna give a little presentation on how I uh, use Tidal to perform with MIDI-based devices. I've got a couple pieces of hardware today. I've got my drum synth, and I also have a uh, uh, MIDI controller that I use to kind of guide my Tidal performance. Um, so uh, this type of setup I've used for a while, and I, I like it because, as Tyler said, it's it does kind of allow me to use hardware, but it also kind of allows me to uh, do less typing and more, uh, I can guide my performance using a controller rather than through typing. And it's just kind of a fun thing I've been doing. Um, I love typing and coding too, but uh, this controller has been kind of, ma made it kind of interesting. Thanks. Don't bump the microphone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to show how I set this stuff up and then how uh, I'm going to walk through a track that I've been performing with and show how I kind of build up the code to allow me to use the controller to control it. Um, so I'm going to start with a few little basics of Tidal MIDI and um, I'm going to start with this diagram, which I didn't the last time. Uh, so basically, basically the idea is um, Super Collider and Super Dirt are at the center of everything. Uh, the blue messages are title messages. So normally, if you are uh, trying to play uh, a synthesizer with MIDI through title and through Super Dirt, title is just sending a certain type of message to uh, Super Dirt, which sends MIDI to the synthesizer. Uh, I'm adding a MIDI controller in here, which is really just sending control changes into uh, Super Super Collider. Uh, it can you, Super Collider can also receive note data, but I'm just using control changes. Uh, those get forwarded back into Tidal, and Tidal can incorporate that data as uh, data in patterns that eventually go to the synthesizer. So this is kind of the setup I'm going to be walking through. Um, before I get into the actual title code, I'll just show a little bit of the title boot up code that makes this work. Uh, all of this is already documented on titlecycles.org, but I'll just walk through it quick. Uh, so in my title boot up code, uh, I'm setting up my external synth, which uh, I give the name Rhythm, And so then I can use this name from title patterns to send out MIDI, uh, MIDI data. Uh, this is pretty vanilla stuff. Uh, but I'm not using any samples here, so this demo is purely just going to be MIDI, the hardware synth. The bottom half of this file is all for the controller input. And kind of similar, we uh, just kind of initialize MIDI devices, and then you can connect to one. This is all documented as well on the website. Um, but I connect to my device, and then the really important part is this MIDI control change handler. Uh, so this function gets called anytime I turn a knob or, or press down one of the encoders on the controller, and it just gets forwarded to Tidal with a control message. So Tidal is listening on port 6010, and this just forwards to that same port. Uh, the only thing that's special in here is I divide every value by 127 so that Tidal gets uh, nothing but values between 0 and 1, because the controller is sending out values between zero and 127. So everything gets scaled to between zero and one. Um, I think that's all I really need to mention about that. So um, let's just kind of get into some patterns here. And I'm, I'm talking kind of quick because I've got a lot that I want to kind of demo in 25 minutes or so. Um, so I apologize if I go, go fast, but always happy to follow up later through direct messages and whatnot. Um, 
So I've got a basic pattern here. I'll just play it. Hopefully that's loud enough for everybody. Let me know if it's too quiet. I can turn it up a bit. That's fine. Um, so with this pattern, uh, I am playing uh, MIDI channel zero. So I've got, you can't really see very well on the camera. Let me try and get a better view there. So every pad on the synth is a MIDI channel. So uh, MIDI channel zero is the first pad, MIDI channel one would be the next pad and so on. And I can design any kind of patch I want on these pads. Um, well, not any kind, but many different kinds of sounds on each pad. This is just the stock sound. Um, but you can even load samples into here as well. Uh, but anyway, as far as the code goes, uh, the synth by default is looking for a note centered around C3. Uh, by default, title will send a note on C5. So I have to explicitly define the note here. Um, and then I can just say to target the, the rhythm uh, synth that I set up in Super Collider. And I'm also using the amp parameter instead of gain since amp is more of a, a linear based way of uh, affecting velocity. And we get that pattern. Uh, okay, so I can obviously uh, pattern out the MIDI channels. So here I've got a pattern of MIDI channels and have a different rhythmic structure. So I can just change what pad's being played. And the synth can also play melodic content as well. So here I have a scale pattern going to the, the bass drum pad. So I can play the, the bass drum melodically. And if I adjust the patch, you can hear it a little bit better here. don't have a drum synth if you have like a, a more melodic synthesizer you can do stuff like this all right uh so uh one of my favorite things to do is to organize my title stuff in a stack and of course you can take anything like I showed up here and you can put it in a stack and make more complex patterns. But sometimes it's a little annoying to constantly be, you know, repeat all this MIDI chan business to know what pad to play. So I've set up some shortcuts like BD, SD, uh, and so on. And that allows me to create some more concise patterns. Uh, it's just, anyway, I'm, I'm always a big fan of creating shortcuts in Title to just make coding a lot faster. Um, there's also uh, kind of a, a technique that uh, I saw Alex post on the Title Club forum um, that allows you to map um, sounds that you would type in the MIDI notation and map each of, the, each of those sounds to a MIDI channel. Um, so if you evaluate this code, you can then type a, a pattern that's more in the fashion of mini notation. Uh, I don't use this myself very much, but um, this is pretty handy. Okay, so let's talk about the controller input a little bit. Uh, so... I'm gonna start with something really simple and just I'm gonna play a, a run of bass drum notes and I'm just going to use a knob on the controller to affect the, uh, the MIDI velocity. So uh, on the amp parameter, which is what affects the velocity, I am, uh, instead of a plain like string pattern or a number, I am using this CF function, which is a, a uh, like a, a basically is receiving a pattern from this 
this control message that's coming from SuperDirt. And uh, so basically we are setting a uh, amp value based on a knob here. Uh, so I've got a, a knob on my controller that is uh, listening, or it's on control number 88. And so when that knob is turned, I'm listening for it in this parameter and it gets assigned to the velocity. I don't remember which knob it is, so we'll see here. So as I turn the knob, it will set the amplitude. And you can, of course, uh, use this for more than just uh, like parameters in synths or, or these uh, types of functions. You can also use them in more like uh, pattern transform functions like degrade by or other things. So um, here I have the same knob, but instead of affecting the amplitude, it is an input into the degrade by function. So if I take the same pattern, uh, now I can adjust how many events are randomly removed, kind of just changing the probability by turning the knob. So here it is all the way to the left, all the way off, and as I increase, you'll hear, um, hear events removed. And now it's all the way to the right, so it's at one, which means degrade everything. So this is this is pretty vanilla stuff. You can find these types of examples on the website, I guess. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting once you start to try and expand on this kind of stuff and start to use MIDI input to change your composition a bit. So for example, you can uh, add it to sometimes by, or in this case, I'm just setting up a simple example of um, setting the probability of sometimes by to duplicate a note a six, 16th step later, which I think is this knob. So that's the basic pattern, but as I turn up the knob, it should start doubling the notes. Randomly. And I've got another one here with a second knob that will also uh, play a clap, play the clap pad um, three sixteenths later. So I've got a couple knobs I can use here. So one's controlling how often the, the clap will play, and the other is controlling how uh, much the pattern is being doubled or stuttered. So this kind of thing is just like a simple, like a building block example. Um, simple things you can do to affect what's going on, what's what's playing. Okay, so I'm gonna start setting up the like the the track that I would perform. Uh, I've got a lot of kind of boilerplate stuff up here that I'm gonna eval first. So this this first block is just my shortcuts for my MIDI channels. Uh, then I've got some helper functions for uh, pattern rotation and random randomization. Um, not gonna get into that stuff today. And then I've got three different rhythmic patterns. I've got my main drum pattern here. I've got a clap pattern and a hi-hat pattern. And then all of this stuff goes into a stack here. I'm going to change my kit that's loaded. So I've got like a pad. I've got a kick drum, a clap, toms, or percussion, hi-hat. Um, so each of these uh, parts in the stack correspond to a different um, pad on the synth. And then each of these is just using a rhythmic structure from the stuff up above. So here's the whole stack. So basically, I, I like to write this kind of stuff just on my own in my spare time. And I kind of approach this as uh, I'll create kind of like a, 
like a dense stack of stuff kind of like this is the final pattern but i want to uh my goal is to be able to control this stack with the um the midi controller be able to remove elements or make elements more intense um, and start to shape this so uh, the first thing is to be able to mute or turn parts on and off so uh, this controller uh, has push button encoders so as i push down on a uh, encoder it will toggle uh, the on position if i push it again it'll toggle off and those uh, on and off messages come in on a particular uh, MIDI control number. So I've created some helper functions here to assist with muting a part. Um, I'm going to talk about this part on function in a second here. But I've got muting for bass drum, background, clap, percussion one, percussion two, and the hi-hat. And each of those is listening for a particular encoder button push. This part on function, it, this is my, this is just like a hack, but it, it makes things really easy. So <laughs> uh, everything coming in from the controller is ranging between zero and one. So I'm casting the particular encoder button that's being pushed to a integer pattern with this CI. So it's either gonna be a one or a zero coming in. Uh, then I flip it. Uh, because it'll be a zero if I have it off and a one if I have it on. And then I flip it with range, so it's like an inverse. And then I put that inside of an every. So then what happens is it'll be every one mute or every zero mute. And then I can use these um, mute patterns down inside my stack. So each BG or each on or off pattern here is either going to uh, mute every one or mute every zero. So that's just kind of my hack here. Um, so by default, all of my encoders are uh, toggled off right now. So nothing's going to play. So if I evaluate this, let me make sure I've got my mutes loaded. Okay, so nothing's playing. I can turn on the, the uh, background pad. Should start in a second here. I can turn on the kick. Percussion one, percussion two, I can turn off the first percussion, turn on the clap, turn on the hi-hat. So you get the picture. I can uh, kind of design a layout that makes sense to me, but then I can turn stuff off and off and on as I choose. Lost my chat window, so hopefully nobody's ask, asking a question. Um, anyway, I'm not going to worry about chat. Oh, wait, there we go. Move that up to the side here. <laughs> we'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, okay, so the next thing I do in this track is um, use a, a function I call reduce, which is really just degrade by. And I think degrade by is probably the laziest feature in title because you can totally just destructure something so quickly with, with it. Um, so if you have a lot of complexity in your pattern, you can back it off pretty easy. In fact, it's so helpful that I've dedicated a single knob to it. <laughs> um, I was even wondering if this is worth presenting, but Anyway, I create a, a sub stack um, inside my outer stack. So I have a sub stack that's just for the drums, and then I put the reduce on that. So then let me turn everything back on here. And my top knob here is controlling reduce. So as I turn that to the right, it'll start to remove events. And of course, I could just you know change the value while typing, but this is so quick. You don't have to hunt and peck for where the value is. You can just turn a knob. These are my secrets. <laughs> okay. 
so some of the more interesting stuff that I start to do with this then, uh, again, this is just kind of a hack, but I will add a um, some repetition using iter. So a lot of the patterns I code aren't really, they don't have a lot of repetition in them. You don't, you don't perceive a lot of repetition. So I think kind of a, a lazy way to do it is, is to use iter. And I will put iter on the entire drum stack. Um, so here I'm just using that push button encoder technique again. It's on this control 89, which is this button here. And when this is on, it will apply iter to um, every one to the pattern. Otherwise, if it's off, this will be zero and it'll be every zero. So every one or every zero, that's the, that's the hack today. Uh, and then I put the use iter to the left of reduce and that goes on the whole drum stack. So So here's no iter applied, but once I push this, you should start to hear a little bit of repetition in there. Turn it off. Turn it back on. Yeah. So that's hack number two. <laughs> Um, the other thing I like to do is mess with tempo and it, it doesn't really, I keep hitting the microphone, sorry. Um, this stuff doesn't necessarily work with everything I do, um, cause it can really result in some wild changes. But, um, uh, what I like to do is, uh, have the tempo deviate by some percentage every cycle and it'll lock to a new tempo every cycle. So I've got some functions here that allow me to do that. Um, kind of starting at the bottom here, I've got this CPS disk, which is, I forget why I named that, uh, named it that. So then this receives a minimum and a max tempo, and it just multiplies the CPS of the whole stack by a certain amount. Uh, the min and the max come from two different knobs. Or I'm sorry, one knob, which is uh, when I twist it, it will uh, scale the min and the max tempo variables to either uh, a certain range um, that I want. And then this disk range uh, just kind of locks using segment will sample and hold that random value once per cycle. So then that kind of results in something like this. As I start to turn this up, you'll hear the tempo variation. And all the way to the right will be the most dramatic change. And you can use this in combination with the degrading and the, the iter. And you get weirdness. <laughs> Maybe it's hard to perceive, but it, it, I never really know exactly what it's going to sound like. Anyway, so that's uh, tempo changes. So I've basically got a dedicated knob for just uh, doing that uh, discrete tempo change behavior. And the more I turn the knob, the more extreme it is. And if it's all the way to the left, then the effect is off. All right. Um, the last kind of trick is a little bit more specific to my synthesizer. Um, there's a, a control change I can send to the synth, which is on control change number 92, and it will change the scene of the kit. And on this synth, a scene means it's just a, a variation on the patch. So it'll allow me to program in a, like a different kit or a different sound on each pad. So I can save a number of scenes and then change it on the fly with MIDI control changes. Uh, as you may guess, I have a knob dedicated to that function. <laughs> uh, and it's actually more of a randomization function. Um, well, here I've got a scene range. So this uh, knob, nine, number 90, will allow me to 
uh, affect the range or, or how, uh, from what range of scenes I can randomly pick from, ranging from zero to four. And then down at the bottom of the stack here, I actually will pick that range and assign it to that MIDI control value. So the more I turn this knob, the more selections from different scenes I, uh, will be randomly chosen. So I'll just start this up again. And as I start to turn the knob, you'll hear different sounds. I don't know if you can see it, but on the machine, eh, you can't see it very well, but there's blue, the, the pads light up in a blue color when a different scene is selected. So that that's really it. Um, the, the way I'd kind of summarize this is that, get the camera right, um, th this is kind of the final state. So this allows me to use all of those little tricks as um, kind of elements in a improvisational ecosystem <laughs> that I've set up with the controller here. So this, this whole setup is like, is like a little sandbox for me to play in with this particular pattern. Um, so I can change scenes, I can change the density, I can turn stuff off, off and on. Like sometimes that hi-hat's a little too much, so I'll take it out. Change the tempo. Use hitter. Hitter with the speed changes is kind of unpredictable. It's kind of fun. Uh, yeah, you get the idea. So it's just kind of this little ecosystem that I can perform in. So each each stack or each pattern is kind of its own little thing. And then when I work on another one, I can um, choose to use the controller in the same way or I can have it control something else. Um, it's kind of whatever I choose. Um, I guess that's all I have. <laughs> That's all I wanted to show. The one thing I didn't show today was another synth that I use, uh, which is a digital synth in my DAW. Uh, but in order to get audio with the Zoom call working, I could not find a way to get that synth into the Zoom call. So I apologize for that. But it's the same principles. Uh, really, I just kind of turn it on and off, and I can affect a few controls on it. So um, the control is the same. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. I wanted to know uh, if the uh, this track, uh, you if you have you already released it, or is it or is it a work in progress? It will be released soon on a local label. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. You know what? I I think it. I think I've got it out on SoundCloud though. I'll share it in the, I think I do have this one track available. I, I got a quick question. Um, how are you? Uh, you are choking? very loud. <laughs> Sorry. How are you? <laughs> how are you um, choking the drum groups? Like um, there's no cut function here being used. Are, are you doing that on the, the rhythm? Yeah, good question. All right, just pasted the link there. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Oh, silly microphone. Uh, yeah, so this, the drum, drum synth does have a specific feature. Um, if you look on the pads here, I'll kind of use my mouse. I can use my finger. So these two pads choke each other. These two pads choke each other. These two, and these two, everything that has like a, a little connection between the pads, they will choke each other. Um, so that is a feature of the, the synth. Um, I am a huge fan of using cut in title with samples. 
Uh, so when it comes to synths, I either have to use a feature of the synth to do it, or uh, sometimes I use legato. Um, so legato is kind of a nice way of truncating a sound at the moment the next event plays. Um, so without cut, I'll use legato or, or I don't have a... So if I make a really long sustain, yeah, you can hear that the, the kick drum gets choked by the, the clap. And same thing with the, what is it? Ah, I'm not going to be able to program that quickly, but you get the idea. So yeah, it's kind of a feature of the synth I'll take advantage of. Any other questions? Mike, this is like an evolution of your of your workflow. Do you feel like you're moving less away, uh, moving away from live coding as a as a concept? I don't think so. Um, and so this is really a performance mode for me. Um, I would argue I do a lot of live coding and live typing when I'm just working on it by myself at home before a performance because I'm using live coding techniques to kind of craft something. But during a performance, yeah, I'm, I'm doing very little typing. However, I do a lot of times miss kind of that, that risk and kind of the open-ended improvisational stuff you can do with typing or live coding. Because um, with this system, I am very constrained. I've got a track and I perform it a certain way and I can't really deviate from that. But um, I've been, yes, I still do work with more of a sample-based approach, which I think is a lot easier for live coding. With synths, I just struggle with a lot. It's a lot more typing and a lot more um, to kind of keep track of in code. So I guess that's why I like to pre-type stuff and then find a different way to perform. But uh, no, there's still a lot of work I like to do with samples and so on. Um, I'm sure I will kind of get into that a little bit more as time goes on. Thanks. I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Yes, I would like to ask, um, I've been using a MIDI to control like you with knobs and with uh, triggers and that was uh, really nice. Uh, but when I tried to use a keyboard input to send notes, I found myself quite limited by uh, not being able to send in an arbitrary uh, rhythm, like being only limited to the rhythm within Tidal. Have you found a way to uh, send notes and be in a, in a way in control without having to resort to very high frequencies? Um, so I've never really um, used these techniques for sending in notes. So I haven't done that, but um, here in the docs, I don't know. If yes, I exactly use these blocks. Okay. So this is, this is all I would really point you to is to use these note on and note off functions to potentially do what you want. But um Okay, yeah, so for now with these, I've been only able to uh, to send in the note I wanted, but not to control the rhythm. But I guess that might be one of the limitations as well. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I don't really know what possibilities there are there. I'm not sure. I haven't played with it. Um... Uh, well, thanks already. I mean, what you shared is already very useful for the mapping of the MIDI controllers. So that's going to be really handy. I know what to do tonight. Cool. Oh, amazing stuff, man. Uh, how do you like mix in uh, MIDI uh, as well as samples ever? Because I always find the timing to be kind of uh, difficult to work with uh, and end up doing a million nudges before I can get them to line up. Yeah, that's been my experience too. Um, it kind of depends on the specific setup I have. Um, if I run my synth audio and super collider into my DAW in a certain way, then sometimes the timing, it just works out by itself. But if I use, um, if I don't route things in the same way, like if I use my interface for samples and a mixer for my synth, then there's a lot of latency difference. And I've had the same experience where I will, um, 
either try to, I haven't had much luck with adjusting latency in super dirt. So instead I I will just nudge like you suggested. That's that's what I do too. So it, it sometimes it works depending on the audio routing in my computer. But if I don't route everything consistently into the same uh, interface, then yeah, I definitely experience a lot of latency too. So, sorry, I don't have a good answer, but I've experienced the same. <laughs> yeah, kind of jealous of the old old way MIDI used to work with Tile, right? Like when it was happening through Haskell instead of SuperDirt. Oh, right, right. Yep. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, go ahead. Uh, sorry, it's me. <laughs> Okay, this question is a little bit more uh, uh, philosophical, I guess, because uh, in this, uh, especially in this, uh, in this uh, configuration uh, for the performance, uh, you use uh, not you, you don't only write, you use also your hands like uh, something more traditional in the electronic music and improvisation. And to me, uh, this is like um, uh, a steps to hybridize a little bit the live act or the concept to live coding. What do you think about that? Because uh, to me, it's difficult uh, maybe think on in just one way to do live coding. And uh, the implementations for the community expands uh, uh, every every time more and more, and you can control this and you can control your body and your code with your body. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I think all options, all ideas should be used. I don't. I don't think it makes sense to just dedicate yourself to thinking only one way. I would use all tools to do whatever you think is fun. Um, what I like about using the controller is it allows me to guide a performance up and down or change the pace much more easily, uh, it, much faster. With live coding and typing, I think the changes are broader and take longer to react to. Um, and there is nothing wrong with that. Because um, I think uh, watching a live coded performance kind of evolve over a longer arc can be really, really fun. And I still enjoy doing that. But for this specific setup, I want to be able to have faster, more reactive changes. So, uh, so to me, it's just, it's still algorithm. Well, I don't know if it's algorithmic or not, but I like using title code to define my sequencing. The rhythms, the title can that the rhythms that title allow me to create are unbelievable. I love title for that. But to control the pace or the levels or the intensity of things, um, I like. I think the controller can be a little bit more expressive for that. But yeah, I think using all ideas and all technology together in whatever way is fun is what's most important. Hopefully that. Amazing, Mike. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> this is a treasure, really, really. We appreciate uh, you share your secrets here. Thank you. Yep. yep, you're welcome. Thanks. All right, I think we have time for one more question. And I saw C. Robo ask something in the chat. Um, where did it go? Oh, so yeah. Are you using any custom SuperDirt synths or parameters? I think. No, I'm not. Everything is 100% from the, the hardware synthesizer today. Um, and then I will also use a, a software synth that's mm -hmm. based out of my DAW, which is called Harmer. Um, but I, yeah, I don't use any synth depths in, in Super Collider. Uh, I've just been really, really lazy to learn Super Collider. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mike. That was pretty mind-blowing.